on March the 13th of 2024, an Oahu grand jury indicted two men for separate chemical attacks in what was determined to have been a murder-for-hire plot on April the 7th of the previous year. A woman in Mililani had a chemical substance thrown on her that caused her clothes and skin to burn. Bodybuilder Davina Lycon was taken to the hospital in critical condition and treated for burns to her head, shoulder, torso and legs. Lycon survived but experienced disfigurement to her face and 30% of her body. Two weeks later, a woman's ex-boyfriend, 21-year-old Paul Cameron, was arrested for the attack and charged with second-degree attempted murder. While detained at the Oahu Community Correctional Center, Cameron met and befriended 30-year-old Sebastian Marquan, who was awaiting trial on drug and assault charges. Cameron arranged for someone on the outside to give the title and keys to his motorcycle to a bail bondsman to secure Marquan's release. The latter was bonded out on January the 22nd and allegedly said that he had a job to do at the Ala Moana shopping mall on the evening of the following day. Marquan approached 25-year-old Chinese language teacher Danying Zhang outside an Ala Moana Planet Fitness. He threw a liquid chemical that caused burns to her face and body. Jiang's throat and lungs were also severely affected after some of the chemical had gotten into her mouth. She was left in critical condition and hospitalized. Jiang, who taught at Mary Knoll School, survived, but was expected to be permanently disfigured. Ma Quan was arrested and charged with second-degree attempted murder in the days that followed. Because of the similarity between the two attacks, in both of which the suspects had used sulfuric acid, the police began investigating a possible connection between Cameron and Maquan. They thus discovered that they'd been jailed in the same module. Moreover, Maquan was found with a handwritten note instructing him how to obtain sulfuric acid and to carry out an attack. A handwriting expert examined the note and determined that Cameron had penned it. Honolulu Police Lieutenant Dina Thoems told the media in a press conference that Cameron had hired Maquan to carry out the March attack as part of a diabolical plot to alleviate suspicions from his own 2023 chemical assault. Zhang had no connection to any of the men and was randomly targeted by Maquan. In the March 24 indictment, the conspiring duo were charged with assault, attempted murder, and conspiracy to commit attempted murder. Number 9. Lao Jordan Lao Lusa On the morning of March the 13th of 2023, firefighters were called to put out a burning vehicle that was parked outside Mililani High School in Honolulu. Inside the burnt-out car was the lifeless body of 21-year-old Army National Guard Specialist Lao Jordan Lao Lusa. It was subsequently discovered that she'd been fatally stabbed in the neck and that the fire had been intentionally set off with the use of an accelerant. Moments before the blaze had erupted, a man carrying a bladed weapon was seen opening and closing the car's doors as he took items from the vehicle. He fled, but a witness followed him until the arrival of law enforcement. Roughly 20 minutes after the fire had broken out, the police arrested 25-year-old Samuel Jones, a specialist in the U.S. Army Reserve, in front of the Mililani Library. Jones was Lulusa's boyfriend, and as he was taken into custody, officers observed that a part of his shoe was melted. Jones also smelled a burnt plastic and had blood on his left ankle. Inside a trash can in the area, officers found bloodied clothes which he was determined to have discarded. On March the 17th, Jones was indicted on second-degree murder and first-degree arson charges. His bail was set at $1 million and he subsequently pleaded not guilty, requesting a jury trial. A motive for the stabbing wasn't released, but an ex-girlfriend of the accused killer agreed to talk to the media under the condition that she remained anonymous. The woman in question had reportedly dated Jones for three years and spoke about a dark side that the man had. Through tears, she said that he became extremely controlling about a year into the relationship 
and when she attempted to end it threatened her, if you try to leave me or if you succeed in leaving me, I'm going to find you and kill you. While he was away on a trip, the woman successfully obtained a temporary restraining order against him and thus managed to escape the abusive relationship. Number 8. Thelma Boyneville On December the 7th of 2017, substitute teacher Thelma Boyneville parked her Toyota Tacoma outside of a vacation rental home on Key Aiki Road in North Shore, Oahu. Boyneville was cleaning the home as a part of a second job to supplement her income. The 51-year-old woman's daughter, Makana, waited for her in the car. Boyneville entered the home as couple Stephen Brown and Haley Dan Durand, both in their early 20s, were in the process of burglarizing it. The duo had gained access to the property through an open window. They threatened Boyneville with bladed weapons before restraining her. The woman was then butchered with knives and a machete, in addition to being bludgeoned with a meat tenderizer. Makana would later recount that a man with green hair subsequently identified as Brown grabbed her from the car, reportedly telling her, we killed your mother. Brown and Dan Durand took Makana upstairs, bound her and duct taped her mouth shut before fleeing in Boyneville's Tacoma. They were arrested in Mililani a few hours later and East reportedly asked officers to shoot them dead claiming that their lives were over. A pair of Australian tourists discovered Makana, who was tied up along with her mother's bloodied body with the murder weapons nearby. During the trial that followed, Brown and Dan Durand each accused the other of having carried out the killing. In 2023, both were given life sentences with parole for second degree murder, as well as separate consecutive sentences for charges that included kidnapping and burglary. Number 7. Dana Alatibi. At around 6 p.m. on July the 20th of 2022, motorists on the H3 freeway near Kapakwari Road in Kailua, Oahu, witnessed a man standing over a woman on the side of the road and attacking her. Good Samaritans rushed to the victim's aid and tried to restrain the suspect who fled into nearby woods. The victim was 27-year-old Dana Alotaibi and she'd been repeatedly stabbed in the neck and head. One witness who asked to remain anonymous told a media outlet that Alotaibi, who was bleeding profusely, looked past the point of no return. She subsequently succumbed to her injuries in a local hospital. The woman was active on social media as an aspiring rapper and YouTuber. She called herself a marine wife on TikTok and also had an OnlyFans account in which she described herself Saudi Arabia's first adult model. She was the estranged wife of Bryant Tahida Castillo, a Marine stationed in Kanawahi and serving with the third littoral combat team. Shortly after the stabbing, law enforcement found him in the woods with the murder weapon, a pocket knife in hand. He had injuries to the neck and wrist which had been inflicted with the same blade. Tahira Castillo survived his knife wounds and was charged with his wife's second-degree murder. He and Alo Taibi had recently separated and at the time of her death, the latter was reportedly 13 weeks pregnant with her new boyfriend. Alo Taibi had allegedly been abused by Tahira Castillo multiple times throughout their three-year marriage. She posted a desperate plea for help on YouTube on January the 2nd of 2022. In a clip titled, Military Spouse, Hawaii, Help, Alo Taibi, cried throughout the video and accused the military of covering up for Tahira Castillo, whom she claimed had never gotten punished for any of the incidents of domestic violence perpetrated against her. In the post's description, the woman wrote, Bryant has been physically abusive countless of times. He's hit me, beat me, choked me, knocked me unconscious, slammed me on the floor, kicked my spine. Alo Taibi noted that she hadn't reported every incident to military police, but the 14 times that she had, 
only resulted in Tejeda Castillo being removed from their home and sent to the barracks without further punishment. The woman explained that her post stemmed from Tejeda Castillo threatening to kill her. As of the latest updates on the matter, the former Marine had pleaded not guilty to his estranged wife's murder and an investigation was launched into the military's handling of Alotaibi's past abuse reports. Number 6. Jaroslav Hanel In January of 2020, officers and firefighters arrived at a home at the far end of the famed Waikiki Beach to a crime scene that grew progressively more chaotic. 69-year-old Jaroslav Hanel, originally from the Czech Republic, reacted with extreme violence upon learning that plans to evict him were finally set in motion. For years, Hanel had been living for free at a property owned by 77-year-old Lois Kane in an upscale neighborhood on Hibiscus Road in exchange for his work as a handyman. Neighbors described him as paranoid and unhinged. He would allegedly harass visitors, chase cars down the street, rig barbecues to blow thick smoke into their windows and film them with a GoPro mounted on his hat. He repeatedly refused to leave the property, even though several neighbors had had restraining orders against him since 2014. It's believed that Hanel sought revenge after his eviction notice was handed down. His rampage began on January the 19th with the killing of Kane. Gisela King, a tenant in the same home, went to find the landlady. Hanel was in the laundry room but wouldn't let King inside. She then heard a sound which she'd later identify as Kane gasping for air. King tried to call the police but Hanel charged her and started stabbing her with a gardening tool. He kept attacking the woman as she curled into a ball and pleaded for her life. Neighbors managed to chase him away, pulled King up the driveway and improvised a tourniquet for her severely wounded leg. As police arrived at the address and walked towards the entrance, Hanel opened fire on them with an AR-15 rifle. Officers Tiffany Enriquez, age 38, and 34-year-old Kulaike Kalama sustained fatal gunshot injuries. Both had reportedly been wearing bulletproof vests but were struck above them. Hanel then set the home ablaze and more gunshot sounds were heard, attributed to Hanel's spear ammunition that caught fire inside. Firefighters were initially asked to keep their distance so that they wouldn't be struck by stray rounds. The fire extended and gutted at least seven homes while damaging several others. The remains of Hanel and Kane were recovered from the ashes and positively identified. Honolulu Police Chief Susan Ballard held back tears as she announced the death of the two officers whom she said were like her kids, while King mourned the passing of Kane, whom she regarded as a mother figure. Number 5. Lindani Maeni A former rugby player and idols contestant from South Africa was fatally shot by Honolulu police officers in April of 2021 following an alleged burglary. A 911 call provided some insight into the incident that ended in the death of Lindani Maeni, reported as a prince from the Zulu Kingdom. He entered an Airbnb rented by Shaheen Sabine Wang and her husband. The woman called the police claiming that an intruder was inside. As confirmed by the caller, Maeni had already left the home when officers arrived at the scene. It was after 8 p.m. and in the dark, a physical struggle ensued between 29-year-old Maeni and the officers, which resulted in them shooting him dead. Two versions of events emerged in the aftermath. It was reported that Maeni had failed to comply after being ordered to get on the ground and that he attacked the officers. They reportedly tried to use non-lethal means of incapacitating the former professional athlete, including a taser, all of which proved ineffective. Fearing for their lives, they then fired their service weapons. Maeni was taken to the Queen's Medical Center where he passed away from multiple gunshot injuries. All three officers were hurt and one of them had to be treated for a concussion. The official version of events was challenged in a wrongful death lawsuit filed by Maeni's widow, Lindsay, originally from Oahu. She, Maeni, and their two children had recently moved to Hawaii. According to the suit, Maeni had thought he was visiting a temple which was next door to the property and left when becoming aware his presence in the home was unwanted. The suit claimed that Maeni had been treated as less than a human being and as an unarmed black man 
had been racially discriminated by the renters and the arresting officers. Maini had asked, who are you? As a flashlight shone into his eyes and a weapon was pointed at him prior to attacking the officers. Body cam footage indicated that they'd only announced themselves as the police after four shots had already rung out. Footage from a doorbell surveillance camera seemingly confirmed that Maini had mistakenly thought he was visiting a temple as he left them repeatedly apologized to the couple. The homeowner reported that the property had been misidentified as such in the past. Maini was also wearing his Yumikeli, a traditional ceremonial Sulu headband, in homage to the spiritual place he thought he was entering. None of the officers were charged in the incident, and it's unclear if the matter would be reinvestigated. For their part, the Wangs reported that Maini had followed them into the home and filmed them, claiming to be the homeowner before rummaging through their bedrooms. Police wouldn't confirm if it was the same story they'd shared when detectives first interviewed them. Number 4. Jill Hansen In May of 2014, a surfer was taken to jail with bail set at $1 million on attempted murder charges after hitting an elderly woman with her car. 73-year-old Elizabeth Conklin had no memory of the incident as she woke up in an ambulance. She was taken to a Honolulu hospital with two black eyes and various internal injuries, but her condition was stable. The incident occurred at the Diamond Head Apartments in Waikiki. 30-year-old surfer Jill Hansen, who also modeled her own line of wetsuits, had waited until Conklin exited her vehicle and then rammed her own car into her. As the victim was lying on the ground, Hansen geared up for a second strike but was stopped by a maintenance worker who knocked on her rear window, potentially stopping her from ending the elderly woman's life. While initially reported as a road rage incident, prosecutors would argue that Hansen had run Conklin over because she was driving a BMW, described as her dream car. She jumped in and tried to drive it away but ultimately fled the scene by flagging down a passing motorist. Hansen was tracked down and arrested. Roughly a year after the incident, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Multiple clinicians determined that she wasn't in control of her actions at the time having previously stated that voices in her head had told her to run Conklin over. Number 3. Honolulu Plane Crash On July the 28th of 2017, a small plane crashed in a remote mountainous region of Oahu 15 minutes after takeoff, killing its four occupants. They were identified as Virginia woman Heather Riley and her boyfriend Garrett Evanson, both in their late 20s along with Texas woman Alexis Aaron and pilot Dean Hutton, aged 32 and 29 respectively. Traffic control operators lost communication with the Beach 19A fixed-wing single-engine aircraft shortly after it had departed from Honolulu Airport. It was determined that it had crashed into the mountainside shortly before 7 p.m. The wreckage and bodies were discovered the following day in the Waianae Mountains above Kunia, an investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board attributed the crash to pilot error and found no mechanical issues with the aircraft. It's been reported that after performing several 360-degree loops, Hutton was flying at a low altitude and too close to the mountain. A witness had reported seeing the low-flying aircraft attempt to make a turn and then hearing a boom after it had gone out of view. Number 2. Xerox Massacre the worst mass murder in the history of Hawaii occurred on November the 2nd of 1999 at a Xerox Corporation building in Honolulu. Service technician Brian Koji Uyesugi entered his workplace armed with a Glock 17 handgun and extra ammunition. Shortly after graduating high school in the late 1970s, Uyesugi had crashed his father's car and sustained an injury from smashing his head on the windshield. According to his brother, he wasn't the same afterwards. After he'd started working for Xerox, his colleagues described him as difficult. He made unfounded accusations towards those in his work group of harassment, backstabbing behavior, and the spreading of rumors which ultimately caused them to avoid him. Uyasugi threatened his colleagues' lives and openly talked about carrying out a mass shooting at the building should he ever be let go. Then, Management began to gradually replace the photocopier that he serviced and Yuyasugi resisted learning the new machine, but on November the 1st, 
His manager insisted he begin training. Believing he was on the verge of getting fired, Uyasugi entered the building the following day armed with the Glock. After a brief chat with an employee, he went to the second floor, where he gunned down employees Ron Kawame and Jason Balatico in one of the offices. He then entered a conference room, where a meeting was taking place. He waved goodbye at the five workers inside, including his supervisor, then executed them. The shooter's rampage resulted in the death of seven colleagues with ages between 33 and 58. Uyasugi fled in a company van and was arrested near the Hawaii Nature Center in Makiki after a five-hour standoff with the police. In the aftermath, the police revealed he had 25 firearms registered in his name. During his trial, doctors determined that he fulfilled the criteria for schizophrenia, but he was deemed competent to stand trial. Hawaii doesn't have the death penalty, and in 2000, the Honolulu-born killer was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 235 years served, the longest sentence ever ordered for a Hawaii inmate. Legislator was passed at state level in the massacre's wake that required doctors to reveal the mental state of people looking to buy guns. We will be lining up our release about when supposed dream trips go wrong right after number one. Stick around if you'd like to watch that one as well still. Number one, Honolulu Strangler. The Honolulu Strangler, Hawaii's first known serial killer, terrorized the paradisical city in the mid-1980s but was never brought to justice. Active between 1985 and 1986, the Strangler was responsible for the death of at least five women. The first victim was 25-year-old Vicky Gail Purdy, the wife of an army helicopter pilot, who was supposed to meet her friends and go clubbing in Waikiki on May the 29th of 1985. She was last seen alive at around 12 a.m. by the taxi driver who'd driven her back to her car. Purdy's lifeless body was found the following morning in an embankment at Kihai Lagoon. Her hands were bound behind her back and she'd been abused and strangled to death. The following two victims were Regina Sakamoto and Denise Hughes, who were killed following the same modus operandi in January of 1986. On February the 5th, a serial killer task force was put together in collaboration with the FBI and the Green River Killer Task Force. The Honolulu Strangler was determined to be an opportunistic killer who didn't stalk his victims but instead preyed on vulnerable women when they were alone at bus stops or other locations. Evidence suggested that to avoid detection, he carried out his crimes in the back of a light-colored van. Two more killings followed. 25-year-old Luis Medeiros disappeared after she told her family she would return by bus from the airport on March the 26th. Road workers found her decomposing body unclothed in the lower half and with the hands bound behind her back near Wilkele Stream in early April. The Strangler's last known victim was 36-year-old Linda Pesque. She was reported missing by her roommate after she'd failed to return home from work on April the 29th. In the aftermath of her disappearance, a man named Howard Gay approached the police, claiming that a psychic had told him where to find Pesquet's body. He led them to an exact location on Sand Island and, while the body wasn't there, it was eventually recovered elsewhere on the island. Gay was arrested and became the police's most prominent suspect. Two of his former partners had revealed that he partook in bondage, a potentially incriminating fetish considering the nature of the crimes. He also fit the suspected build and age of the killer. Gay was interrogated for hours and took a polygraph test, which came back inconclusive. However, much of the evidence that the authorities had to tie him to the killings was deemed circumstantial. He became a free man and stated, the police have released me, that's all I know. They have plenty of good cause, they're doing their job. The killings stopped following his arrest and release. Gay died of kidney failure in 2003. Several leading members of the task force believed that had DNA testing been available at the time, he would have been confirmed as the Honolulu Strangler. In the spring of 2023, Canadian woman Kiara Agnew and her boyfriend, Ryan Fryson, an ice hockey player for the Dawson Creek Canucks, were on holiday in Mexico. The couple were staying at the Princess Resort in Playa del Carmen on the Caribbean Gold Coast, south of Cancun. They'd taken the trip to celebrate Agnew's upcoming 24th birthday. As reported by her family, she'd been counting down the days to the trip since Christmas and was particularly excited about seeing the Mayan ruins, a destination that was part of the traveling package. Agnew, however, never returned from her trip 
As reported by Mexican authorities on March the 3rd, the young woman's lifeless body was discovered in the resort's laundry room with visible injuries and bloodstains. Her suspected killer was found sleeping beside her on the floor. He had swelling on his hands and traces of blood on his clothes. And the police found there was enough evidence to arrest him on suspicion of murder. While local authorities didn't directly confirm that the man in question was Fryson, subsequent information indicated that the suspect was a 26-year-old Canadian man. Number 6. Victor Masson In May of 2023, Canadian banker Victor Masson was visiting a popular beach resort in Oaxaca, Mexico, alongside his girlfriend, Mexican national Elva Castillo. The couple had spent Sunday, May the 14th at the beach and in the evening, 27-year-old Masson remained at the hotel while Castillo went to have dinner with her family in Puerto Escondido. The man eventually decided to go out by himself and ended up at the El Aldoquin bar. At some point in the night, he argued with a group consisting of two men and two women over an unpaid tab. He sent Castillo a message that read, I have no idea what's going on. If I text you the word danger, find my location and call the police, okay? Masson sent the woman an additional message claiming he was stuck with them, referring to the group because they'd intercepted him when he tried to leave and return to his hotel. The following morning on May the 15th, Masson's body was found in his car with fatal gunshot wounds about two miles from the bar. The alleged killers had taken the man's wallet but left behind his cell phone and passport. Castillo reported Masson missing after he'd failed to show up at the hotel before learning about his death a few hours later. Towards the end of May, local law enforcement reported that they'd arrested the suspected gunman but didn't disclose his identity. Number 5. Vladimir Popov How rowing footage taken in Urgada Egypt in June of 2023 showed a 23-year-old Russian national out in the Red Sea as he was circled by a tiger shark. Vladimir Popov's girlfriend, also aged 23, had managed to swim away while his father, Yuri, helplessly watched from the shore. Vladimir, who traveled to Egypt a few months prior, was shown in videos taken by beachgoers screaming out, Papa, save me. As the shark's fin moved towards Vladimir, he vanished from the surface. The man's head briefly reappeared above the water one last time and the shark was seen writhing with its jaws clamped on his body. The ferocious predator then pulled Vladimir further into the depths and mauled him to death. Distraught, Yuri later told a media outlet that the meat grinder happened in 20 seconds. He was just dragged under the water. He went on to describe the incident as some kind of evil fate since the beach they'd been visiting was known as safe. Following the attack, the tiger shark was dragged to land via boat and clubbed to death. Updates from June the 9th indicated that Yuri had decided to have his son's remains cremated and returned to Russia. Number 4. Pauline Moore In the summer of 2008, British woman Pauline Moore traveled to the resort of Bracebridge, north of Toronto, Canada, for what was supposed to be a five-week holiday. She was staying with her niece and other relatives in rented cottages near McKay Lake. 62-year-old Moore had taken the trip to get over the death of her husband, Kevin, who passed away from a brain hemorrhage. On August the 24th, she set off on a jet ski and told her niece she was going for a little ride. According to reports from others at the lake, Moore wasn't going particularly fast and the lake wasn't busy. However, at some point during the ride, she swerved sharply, as if to avoid something. It was suspected that the afternoon sun, which was bright and low, had dazzled the woman. Moore missed the marker that warned of underwater rocks and fatally crashed the jet ski into a reef. A coroner would later report that the woman's death was instantaneous. Her grieving sister-in-law told a media outlet that the family took some comfort in the fact that Moore hadn't suffered in her final moments. Number 3. Owen Family 68-year-old Louis Owen and his wife, Rosemary, aged 65, were visiting the beachside resort town of Hua Hin in Thailand in April of 2016. The trip in which they were joined by their son, also named Louis, took place at the time of the Thai New Year's Songkran Festival, when the streets traditionally turned into giant water fights. The family encountered a group of four men ranging in ages from 20 to 32, whom witnesses claimed were already rowdy and looking for a fight. The men had started brawling among themselves when 43-year-old Louis accidentally knocked into one of them and caused him to spill his drink. 
The men then angrily pushed Lewis to the ground. Rosemary intervened and slapped one of the assailants. Moments before another punched her husband, the group then set upon the family and started viciously beating them. The prolonged assault was captured on CCTV and the footage later drew outrage from the general public and criticism towards Thailand's pre-existing reputation of often failing to provide safety for its tourists. Rosemary was struck with such force that she was knocked unconscious, while her son and husband were relentlessly punched and kicked even after they dropped to the ground. When Rosemary regained her senses, she was forcefully kicked in the head. Onlookers intervened in the attack's aftermath while all three members of the Owen family lay unconscious in the street. The father and son received stitches while Rosemary was hospitalized for a few days as she needed surgery to reduce swelling in her brain. The family had been frequent visitors to Thailand but vowed to never return. Their attackers, Chaya Jaiboon and Siva Noxri, both aged 20, along with Supata Batong and Yingyai Siangkamin, both aged 32, were arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit group assault. They confessed their crime and were each sentenced to two years in prison. They apologized to the victims and blamed the attack on their intoxicated state at the time. Number two, Henry Miller. 19-year-old Henry Miller from Bristol, England, traveled to Colombia on February the 14th of 2014 and was staying at a hostel in the country's south. The teen last contacted his family on April the 22nd before he set off in the rainforest to take part in a shamanic ritual. It was his second ceremony that involved consuming a brewed drink called Yage, also known as Ayahuasca or Capi, among other indigenous groups in South America. One of the brew's active ingredients was dimethyltryptamine, commonly abbreviated as DMT, a potent hallucinogen which causes intense changes in perceptual awareness. Indigenous cultures in the Amazon are said to use the brew as the means of inducing spiritual visions. Miller had attended a ceremony on April the 20th, during which he drank three cups of Yage, but subsequently told his family that he'd felt nothing. He returned to the tribe two days later and took part in another ceremony. Shortly after drinking the brew, Miller fell gravely ill and had trouble breathing. Two teenage tribesmen took him towards a local hospital, but Miller died on the way. The teenagers panicked and abandoned him on the side of the road in the remote Putamayo region, where he was later found by local police. In the incident's aftermath, the authorities in the UK determined that Miller's death had been accidental. The tribe held its own trial in July of 2014, attended by a representative of the British Foreign Office. The tribe reiterated they'd never meant to harm Miller but share their cultural practices with him like they did with other foreigners. It was determined that shaman Guillermo, his wife Mama Concha, their son and his friend should be punished with nettles for their role in the teen's demise. The four later sent an apology letter to his family. Number one, Alona Savchenko. Alona Savchenko and her boyfriend, Jertsi Lagoda Filipao, checked into the key Sathorn Charan Raj condominium building in Bangkok's Bangkau Lam district on April the 29th of 2023. Lagoda Filipao owned an advertising firm registered in London and Savchenko, an aspiring model, had recently done photo shoots for his company. In the months leading up to the Thailand trip, photos from the Ukrainian woman's social media showed her posing in different picturesque locations in Istanbul, Valencia, Rome and London. On May the 15th of 2023, surveillance footage from the high-end condominium showed Lagoda Filipao leaving with a suitcase but without his girlfriend, acting on a tip from a taxi driver. The police then raided the couple's 32nd floor apartment. They found Savchenko's mutilated body on a bed beneath a blanket. Her face was covered in blood. She'd been nearly decapitated and had also been stabbed in the chest. One of her hands was hacked off at the wrist and the police found a sword near the bed. The taxi driver who'd alerted law enforcement had reportedly been asked by Lagoda Filipao through Google Translate to help dismember his girlfriend's body in exchange for $44. He refused before dropping off the man at a hotel in the Sathorn district and calling the police. A manhunt for Lagoda Filipao was launched 
Later that night, police officers and a ranger force were patrolling a market in the Aram Prathet district on the Cambodia border. A sniffer dog then ran up to a foreigner. Sitting alone at a stone table, law enforcement recognized him as Lagoda Philippao from the picture of him that had been sent out. The man was arrested about 135 miles from the murder scene in Bangkok, and as he was preparing to board a minivan and cross into Cambodia, inside his luggage the police found Savchenko's passport. Officers reported that Lagoda Philippao had refused to speak to them but was remarkably calm in spite of being taken into custody as a murder suspect. A police lieutenant told the media that he drank coffee as normal in his cell and started exercising like it was his normal morning routine. Thanks for watching.